A Zoom opportunity to catch up with Dee Ryle, who's the CEO um, of GW Global, uh, attending to the challenges that cities and states face uh, each and every day. And uh, Lord knows 2019, uh, sorry, 2020 and 2021 have got plenty of challenges uh, coming up. Uh, Dee joins us on The Informer. Dee, welcome. Thank you. Life, to be here. life very, very different being a CEO today from the, your, was it 10 or more years as a member of the Legislative uh, Assembly in, uh, in the Victorian State Parliament? That's right. It was eight years, actually. Eight and years. Uh, it, it went quite quickly. But uh, yes, now is very different. Can I, can I re reflect on a moment before we go forward? What did you, what was the biggest lesson that you learned in those eight years? I think it's listening to your community, understanding what the issues are, uh, and and to be able to uh, identify how those things can be rectified and, and develop a path forward. Well, that sounds fantastic. Why are we seeing so many politicians struggling with that very simple premise of listening it's and understanding? Question. Yeah, it's it's a that's a good question, and um, I think it, it, you know people talk about the Canberra bubble. I think there's also a Spring Street bubble, and we tend to when we're in there, it's it's hard to discern, uh, you know, the the reality of life for people outside. Now we're out in the community, so we're hearing people and understanding, but at the same time, Parliament itself is is a bubble, and uh, it's often difficult to sift. Uh, the the issues and understand the issues because you've got different people with different uh, needs and agendas. Uh, you mentioned agendas. In Adelaide, it's North Terrace. In New South Wales, in Sydney, it's Macquarie Street. In Melbourne, of course, yes. it's Spring Street, the Paris end of Melbourne. Uh, but you are so right. There are competing interests and they're competing for your attention, uh, for, for your voice, uh, for your reasoning constantly. In those eight years, you, you said to me, just before we came on air, you said to me, uh, very different deadlines, very different pace of life as a CEO. And you would think, a CEO, very busy person. Uh, you know, GW Global, a lot of things you need to attend to. But the life of a politician, and we need to remind people, is exhausting. I know we don't give them enough credit, but it is exhausting. Can you give us a glimpse, a snap, uh, of those days when you were working, what time would you start and what time did you finish? Well, if you were doing train stations, you'd be up at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, on a normal morning, you'd be out of the house by 7.30. Um, if you're in Parliament, even earlier than that, um, a, a day would finish around about, could be 9, 10 o'clock in the evening. Uh, you know, we've just had Australia Day, citizenship ceremonies, uh, community events and so forth. So it's it's very long days, but it's not just five days a week, it's seven days a week. Weekends are just as busy as the weekday. And you not only have to be seen to be out there, you actually have to be out there. And there is no in-between when it comes to that. And but I thought business, 15 years before uh, politics, I was in business and I thought that was a busy life. It was nothing compared to my political life. No, it, it is. But the pace has changed. Yeah, I was just going to say, people in this day and age of ours, we don't readily give enough people enough credit. Uh, it's easy to bag people. It's like you're watching your favourite football team and if your football yeah. uh, champion uh, does, you know, lets you down that day or your team loses, you bag them for no other reason that yeah. your hopes and aspirations were crushed that day. And it seems to me that we love to empty on our politicians all the time. Now, some of them deserve it, but there are an awful lot of them who work really, really hard and do what they can. And there's a challenge currently in Victoria and in Melbourne City. Uh, we've got this extraordinary fight going on. There's a second uh, uh, safe injection room that's being planned. The government has been wanting to put it in one place. The community is screaming. We've even heard one of the uh, more diplomatic uh, Lord Mayors who hardly ever uh, raises a hand or raises a voice uh, against government now saying, look, uh, we need to keep talking because where you want to put it is so, so wrong, not only for the optics, 
but for so many other reasons. And you know what I'm talking about. It's the Victoria Markets, the second injecting room. Um, already we know that the, the, the uh, criticism about the original in safe injecting room in Richmond continues to uh, create uh, massive controversy. And just when you're thinking you're on top of that, along comes another decision. Why would the state government decide to put, of all places, right next to one of the iconic pieces of Melbourne's tourism precinct, uh, a safe injecting room? Well, even if it was the first safe injecting room, it wouldn't be the right place. Um, having a second uh, is, is a wrong decision based on the data, based on the facts. And that's the data that the government handpicked panel uh, actually handed down a report not so long ago, uh, middle of last year, that actually shows, uh, the data shows that the injecting room actually increased the number of lethal overdoses in the area, uh, didn't reduce them. So uh, why why you'd have a second one, or why you'd have a first one even at, at um, Victoria Market, let alone where it is in Richmond, but a second one at Victoria Market, you've got tourism and we're hoping that tourism returns pretty quickly. You've got students, you've got businesses, you've got shoppers. And so it's a very busy place. And the people of North Richmond will will absolutely tell you the horrific stories of uh, syringes are everywhere, people injecting in the streets even still, uh, and, uh, and the problems that the drug market there has created. Well, OK. You understand that. You, you are eight years in Parliament. You're at, the, you're at the coal face each and every day. You know all the characters. You know many of the, the key players. Why would the Premier, who loves being on the right side of the, uh, of the controversy, who likes to be on the right side of the publicity machine, why would he be putting himself right in the crosshairs of all those people who, who just don't want it? Well, I, I, look, if we go back to the the opening of the first one or, or his reasoning for the first one uh, his reasoning for that was that what people were dying in the streets um, and you know nobody wants that absolutely no one wants people dying in the streets um, to keep in mind there was the Northcote by-election there uh, at the time and there were issues with the Greens and and so it, it wasn't just that uh, anybody who says it was just that is wrong uh, politics certainly played into it but uh, you know the the Premier says that he is the most progressive Premier in the state of Victoria and this therefore is goes along with uh, with his progressive mindset um, set aside the location, just having a second facility goes along with his second mindset. Now, um, there are champions for injecting rooms. Um, in Sydney, we haven't seen a second injecting room and theirs has certainly been there a lot longer than ours. Um, the other thing is that the, the panel in their report as I said, it was a hand-picked government report. This is an independent research that was done, uh, but in their report um, stated they want another three years of the trial for the Richmond injecting room, while at the same time, because they don't have sufficient evidence to show that they've actually turned things around because there was still uh, tragically around 27 deaths in the same period or 25 deaths in the same period as there had been uh, relatively the same in each year before. So uh, in terms of the number of deaths in the city of Yarra, nothing had changed uh, in terms of that number of deaths. So they don't have sufficient evidence to, to show that they've actually had an impact on uh, the, those um, saving those lives in the local area. Uh, therefore, they want another three years. But while we're here, uh, let, let's put another one up. Um, uh, Dee Ryle, uh, that to me is the biggest red flare uh, anyone could send up. You need three more years. You're in that trial period. That, that, that should be telling each and every person that we have a massive challenge. Uh, and let's not make a decision un unless we know it's the right decision. And of all the places to go and put it where they plan to put it, right next to or very close to the Victoria Markets precinct, I am stunned. Uh, what's next? What do you think we can do? Well, there's a number of things. And obviously, the, the company that I 
uh, Head Up is is based in the US, and we work, uh, as as you mentioned in in your opening, uh, with communities and regions to to make major transformation, and that's really about um, dealing with their challenges uh, head on, and. One of the areas that we're working with has been the centre of the opioid epidemic in the US and anybody who's familiar with it, it, it certainly is uh, and has been an epidemic. Um, now, in terms of what to do, there are things that they do and I, I spoke to uh, one of the politicians there and they said, look, we, we're not going down the injecting room path because we don't need to. We're, uh, we're implementing, they have their needle exchange program. They ha actually have excellent programs for rehabilitation and they have a, a drug court. Now, we don't have a drug court in Richmond, which is where our, <clears throat> pardon me, where our major problem is. Um, but they have local drug courts in the drug court and, and they work with the, the, the emergency services, the police, the judiciary, uh, the, the cities. They're, they're all working together uh, to come up with the solution. And certainly the White House has take, stood up and taken notice. Uh, the other cities across uh, the US uh, have taken notice. Stanford, uni other universities, uh, well-known and recognised universities are, are actually uh, identifying what they're doing in this region as being uh, best practice. And so uh, they have excellent rehabilitation programs. But in their drug court, if you think about it, a, a person uh, comes to uh, to court, they've either been found with drugs or a traf uh, trafficking or what, whatever the reason being. Uh, the first thing they do at the drug court is identify what the reason is that the person is in that situation. Were they homeless? Uh, are they without a job? Do they have mental health issues? Mm. Are they a subject of abuse? Um, and so they first identify those issues. Now, you don't fit into that character, uh, you know, that characterization um, or into uh, that category, then, then they deal with that separately. But when you do uh, you, you're essentially channeled then into the areas uh given a job gotten a place to live gotten into a program mm. and not just a two-week detox rehab program you're actually this is a long-term program to actually turn lives around something more meaningful uh, if you have a, a recommendation uh, for daniel andrews the premier what would it be it would be to set aside the politics, set aside um, the bravado and the ego and come together with the people who can actually work together and, and develop a solution because only then uh, are we actually going to get to the outcomes that we need to achieve. And achieve the sort of success that we must to improve our society and our community. Dee Ryle, thank you very much for taking us, one, that little step back uh, in time to give us a glimpse of what our politicians do have to cope with each and every day, and also for taking us forward and giving us a sense of the, the challenge that's staring everybody in the face, especially when they're contemplating a, a, you know, a second uh, safe injecting room in Melbourne. Thank you, Dee. Thank you, lovely to be with you. All the best. Dee Ryle on The Informer.